Hello, everybody, and welcome to What the Hell Should I Watch? I'm Steve Stebbing. And I'm Chloe Stebbing. And uh, we are the weekly list of what we're watching, uh, which may become what you're watching. And we come at you every Friday at 9 a.m. Pacific time uh, right here on stevestebbing.ca. And, uh, well, let's just get to what's fresh. <laughs> All right, so fresh for your eyeballs. Um, After two weeks of not great horror, uh, we got Bad Boys, Ride or Die, and I was pretty excited about this one. This summer, the world's favorite bad boys are back with their iconic mix of -of edge-of-your-seat action and outrageous comedy, but this time with a twist. Miami's finest are now on the run. Starring Will Smith and Martin Lawrence, directed by Adil L. Arby and Bilal Fala. Yeah, and they these are the guys that did the last film, um, and the first two films of the this franchise are uh, Michael Bay films, and the second film is probably in the running of like best action films of all time like i it's if there was like a top 100 list you know that both bad boys movies would be in that list and i would argue that even three and four have an argument to be in in like the back end of that list because they're just fun movies and they're established characters that we've kind of been all about this bromance since the mid 90s so well established but i mean not without the 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 real life people and their problems are things that you think about when you watch them now right martin lawrence has had kind of mental episodes will smith slapped chris rock on a on the oscar stage they all have like crazy baggage. And of course, Jada Pinkett's book release in the last uh, little bit, um, <laughs> adding so much more uh, drama to his situation. Um, but the movie's fun. The, the action cinematography is really cool. I really like it when they use new technology to make mm-hmm. action scenes hit harder. And there are definitely a lot of, that usage in this definitely a lot of drone stuff drones is the new are the new hotness right now right when it comes to filmmaking drones are the new hotness so you definitely use a lot in this one um i was very aware that vanessa hudgens is growing older as an actress uh playing a cop character in this but like i mean she's She's got to be in. She's in her thirties net by now, right? Vanessa Hudgens, because I, I think Zac Efron or 40s. is. Yeah, she looks very young, mm-hmm. and it has for a long time. But I just noticed that she's like, I didn't take her as like a teen or a twenty-something actress anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought she looked older than Alexander Ludwig, who I think is probably roughly her the same age. I don't know. There's there's some really fun full circle moments in this film that I really like, especially as a fan of the franchise. And just for full disclosure for the audience, you're not you haven't seen any of these films, so you don't really have anything to say about them. And they're really not in a genre that you really care about anyway. Right. Not entirely. Like lately, I've been kind of watching a lot of action. We watched Doom 2005. That was horrific. And then <laughs> and then we watched Hardcore Henry, which I really, really enjoyed. I love that film. And then Boy Kills World. Yes, which is uh, a film that I saw, um, that I reviewed on this show a few weeks ago. So I'm glad you finally got to check that one out. That's that's a wild one. We should talk about that one. We should we yeah. should butt in about that one later because that's a, it's a solid movie. Um yeah, there's uh, there's actual references to both Martin Lawrence and Will Smith's candles, kind of. Like, they definitely make mention Will Smith gets slapped a bunch. Spoilers. I'm sorry. Um, 
but I don't know. I had a fun time with this movie, so uh, I, I I thought it was solid and definitely a good movie to watch in theaters. Like I I, I thought it definitely um, did its job in being a popcorn uh, experience. Uh, this one, uh, this is Chloe's uh, review right now. I'll have my thoughts about it next week. Uh, but this is uh, Inside Out Two. Follows Riley in her teenage years encountering new emotions. And I got a laundry list of voices in this one. And it probably doesn't even include all the voices in this. But it's uh, featuring the voices of Amy Poehler, Maya Hawk, Kensington Tallman, Lisa, Lam- uh, Lisa Lapira, or sorry, Liza Lapira, Tony Hale, Lu- uh, Louis Black, Phyllis Smith, and Ao Adibri. And it's written and directed by Kelsey Mann. And I believe this is Kelsey Mann's debut film. And uh, the reviews were were good. I think we're expecting them to be good. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm a little jaded on these films because I wasn't a huge fan of the first film. But you were. So you came into this in a better way than I did. Yeah. I mean, I was 14, 15 when it came out in, in 2015. So I was still like a kid, right? And I really enjoyed it. It's a film that I actually recently rewatched before going to Inside Out 2. And I liked it that time too. Um, The first one, for me at least, is kind of better than the second one. Um, the, the, The main conflict is kind of the same as as the one that they did in the first one where it's like, Oh, a new emotion. We don't know how to, how to deal with it. Joy specifically doesn't know how to deal with it. Mm-hmm. And you get ejected to the back of the mind again. And right. You know, it's, and then it has to find the their thing. way back. It's the same. Yeah, journey. exactly. Well, that's a little, it's the formula, I guess. Right. You yeah. would hope that there would be some more to expunge on. Um, and because that's where I was, that's where I thought that, Pixar was really kind of going back to the well because I don't think inside out. And again, I'm coming at it a different way, but I didn't think it really, really needed a second film. It wasn't the Incredibles. The Incredibles needed a second film. There are certain films that when they come out, you're like, Oh yeah, I I definitely want more of that one. And I Mm -hmm. see where there's more room to grow. And with these new emotions, they are, there is definitely seems room to grow but if you're not if you're not going to deviate in the story that you're telling then it's not really worth it yeah and like this very much is a movie for children so you can kind of understand why they kind of just recycled the plot because it did work the first time Mm -hmm. but it does make it less enjoyable for anybody who's over the age of eight right um but i mean I, I still cried. <laughs> like it, it, it still got me and I still related to it. Like I could, mm-hmm. I could th- think back to like how I was at that age and like how similar the struggles were and right. em- empathize with that. But that's one thing that kind of confused me about the timeline of this film, because in the first one, I think Riley's like 11 or something. Um, And that came out in 2015. And then in this new one, she's 14. I believe she's 14. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of just like a weird jump because like the, the, the audience that really resonated with the first one would be kind of way past Mm -hmm. that point because it's been almost 10 years. So I don't know. I just, maybe I'm just being way too nitpicky about it and thinking way too deeply (laughs) about it, but I'm like, this is not going to reach the same people that it reached the first time. No. And it's again, part of it's, it's a piece of Pixar trying to still net their core with their core audience and, and, and always their core audience, which is the kids. Mm -hmm. Um, But, uh, I mean, the same sensibilities aren't the same for uh, 1995 kids when Toy Story came out or the 2003 kids 
uh, with uh, Finding Nemo and stuff like that. Not that the films have diminished entirely, but I just think the reverence of Pixar has diminished. Um, and and the must-see theatrical experience of Pixar has diminished a bit. Um, I, I think it goes as far back as like The Good Dinosaur and, and some of those films, and they're not bad I films. That even existed. Right? Like, there are so many Pixar films, and I still am a guy that enjoys Pixar. Um, I know a lot of the internet does not enjoy Pixar, but I thought Turning Red was great and such a fantastic mm-hmm. allegory that, yes, I even I picked up on that allegory of the whole, of, of the whole thing. Uh, and I just thought it was a well-crafted story. I really enjoyed Luca. Um, I, I enjoyed Soul as well. Uh, I think Soul is a beautiful film. Um, and I don't know. I, I'm still on board with Pixar, but I mean, there have been kind of mid-ish. <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> like mid, but better than mid. Mid enjoyable. But Lightyear is mid enjoyable. Mm-hmm. It's an enjoyable film. As far as a Pixar release, it is kind of mid because it is, it's a branch off. It's, it's an extra film, yeah. right? Well, so I, I, I do think that you could link that pattern all the way back to the 90s with the release of A Bug's Life because that didn't do well. No, it didn't. And it should have done well because it is, I mean, it is a good foundation of what Pixar mm-hmm. was. Pixar was animated cinema. They were making these big, grandiose computer animated films. And mm-hmm. Bugs Life, I mean, I said it last week, it is an adaptation of uh, Seven Samurai. Like, it is trying to embody like one of the original great stories. And uh, I know uh, Pixar is sometimes very on point and some points very uh, they've kind of lost what they were. But mm-hmm. the prestige wears off always with time. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It's it's going to happen to A24. It's going to happen to to Neon, sadly. Um, Because even A24 has said that the sustainability of making all these great and um, original and nuanced and and kind of renegade films is, well, it doesn't pay a lot. So they're going to need to have a more expensive IP, a franchise, something they can push. So it happens to them all. It happens to them all. So, but that said, I still keep an open mind for my screening of Inside Out to uh, this week. And you would recommend it for people to see in theaters, I assume. I I would recommend. Well, I don't think theaters really makes a huge difference for it. Um, of course, it's beautiful. I mean, the the detail is amazing. Mm-hmm. But I don't think it really adds too too much to the experience. Hmm. But, you know, if you want to go see it in theaters, then do that to, you know, support theaters. Absolutely. We support theaters here. 100%. I I mean, I see a movie every week and I don't have a press pass. I'm still paying regular Mm -hmm. pop for it. You know, if I do have a screening pass, I would definitely use it. But I don't have (laughs) one at this point. If Landmark, if you're listening out there, I would definitely take a press pass. But that'd be super cool. That'd be so cool because you have a landmark near you too. Yeah. Yeah. That would be so great. Yeah. (laughs) That'd be so awesome. We would be a sponsored podcast for landmark. That's the dream actually. That's the, that's the dream babies. That's the dream. All right. Let's move (laughs) on to another animated film. Robot dreams. The Adventures and Misfortunes of Dog and Robot in New York City during the 1980s. Written and directed by Pablo Berger, based on the graphic novel by Sarah Barron. Uh, And this was made, uh, well, originally supposed to be released in 2023. And for whatever reason, the release was bobbled around and it finally landed in the lap of Elevation Pictures, who is giving it it is uh, kind of a small-ish theatrical run. Uh, and if you look at the reviews, they are stellar because it is really such a stellar film, uh, has no dialogue. Um, and the main character, like the, the main character dog, it's like animals make up humanity. Like it's like Zootopia, right? Like all animals kind of make up the world and 
dog's lonely so he sees a commercial for a robot and buys the robot activates the robot and that's like the birth of the robot right the robot's a new mind in the world and they pal around forever like just together just around around the city and just do their thing uh until the robot uh is left inert and just basically is lying on the beach and he can't it's be it's behind a trespass gate and he can't get to this robot so that basically now they're living two separate existences and the robot is living through dreams it's having and as well as interactions he's going through on the beach of of people and th and things discovering him and it is so beautifully poignant and such so off the path of anything mainstream that yeah, you're not going to see a lot of ads for this one, a, lo a lot of push on a film like this, but it's beautiful. And I think it's an important animated film. And I, I, I love that films like this are still getting released and still getting um, a theatrical release on any sort of a feature level. Um, this movie kind of reminded me, I don't know if you ever saw a movie called Marcel the Shell with Shoes On, um, uh, I, which is I like stop, it. stop animation. Yeah. I... I, I highly, highly recommend this film. That's felt that film made me freaking cry. Like <laughs> it is so filled with beauty and is just the most from the most simplest places. And I feel like Robot Dreams also has that kind of soul with it too. And at the end of it, it still leaves you with a smile. Um and I thought um, it was really an interesting story from the Sarah Veron. Um, I kind of wanted to check out what else she has as far as uh, graphic novels go, because uh, this film definitely piqued my interest and I really loved it. And it's funny because it was really highly recommended on the other podcast I do uh, after the credits. Um, and I finally got a chance to see it. And yeah, they were absolutely right. All right, uh, let's check out uh, what's going on in the Blu-ray world. That's right on the blue. I just have one and it was like a late edition and it's going to be so hilariously stupid uh, once I bring it up. But uh, they gave a brand new Blu-ray reissue of this one. It's Beverly Hills Ninja. A man tries to rescue a woman with a little help from his half-brother, starring Chris Farley, Nicolette Sheridan, and Robin Shaw, directed by Dennis Dugan. Dere Dennis Dugan coming off of Happy Gilmore. Uh, this was 1997. Happy Gilmore was 1996. Uh, so, of course, uh, Sandler's buddies get movies. I mean, Chris Farley, they were really pushing, pushing for him to be a big old star because Tommy Boy was big. Uh, Black Sheep wasn't as big, but it still celebrated the same thing. But now they're trying to push him as um, a set, like as a separate star away from David Spade, using his slapstickiness uh, to a, a minstrel degree. Because uh, I mean, he's clearly squeezing all the charm into this movie, but nothing else is. Like nothing else works in this movie. It's just a really, really uh -oh. bad movie. And and so bad that apparently when he saw the screening of it, he cried. <laughs> he was so disappointed by this movie. Oh, no. uh, and I mean, he was dead by the end of 1997, right? He died in November, or December 1997. Um, so, yeah, this is like a movie that's like the beginning of the end type thing. <laughs> and it's it's so sad. Um, and they really try to play up the Mortal Kombat angle in this one because Robin Show, who plays his brother in this movie, um, played Liu Kang in the original Mortal Kombat movie, which was a hit in 1995, I believe it was. Um, and <laughs> like one funny thing is Jen, my wife, uh, said this is pretty much Kung Fu Panda, isn't it? <laughs> no. I mean... Beverly Hills Ninja walked so Kung Fu Panda could run, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll say that. Um, and for, this is like a random fact, but uh, Christian Bale, when asked what his favorite movie was, names this as his favorite comedy, though he's ever only ever watched it twice. So Christian Bale fucking loves this movie. <laughs> <laughs> 
I love this. I love this fact that like Academy Award winner Christian Bale loves this movie. I love it. I love it. Uh, but I don't love this movie. <laughs> it's, just, it's not good. It's not good. Even like they bring Chris Rock in quickly. And then they like for the climax, they're like, oh, yeah, we better bring Chris Rock along for the rest of it. And he's like a bellhop in it. You, it feels like a throwaway character. <laughs> I don't know. This this it made me sad. It made me. It's part of that late 90s latch on to anything comedy. And apparently this script bounced around. For years before getting made i forget who else uh was was they were trying to line up oh it was uh dana carvey they're trying to get dana carvey to do it uh in like 1991 um but App- opportunity Knox had just bombed and he didn't want to do movies until wayne's world came along in 92 and he did that one but yeah not a good movie <laughs> <laughs> it, it is a steaming pile which makes way for the yeah that's right streaming pile making the poop joke again again you're welcome you're welcome so uh, let's class it up though i'm gonna bring a documentary this is all that breathes Amidst the darkening backdrop of Delhi's apocalyptic air and escalating violence, two brothers devote their lives to protect one casualty of the turbulent times, the bird known as the Black Kite, directed by Shanak Sen, and it's available on Crave. And this is like one of those slice of life documentaries, just following two brothers that basically care for these uh, these birds, that these kites. Um, which are incredible looking like falcon looking birds like they're and and quite aggressive too they can get quite aggressive and there's a few scenes where i'm like holy crap like the dive bombing i'm like you gotta have some some uh serious fortitude to want to be up on the rooftops there but just to see these brothers like one after the other like repair um and and nurse these kites back to health and everything when they're injured um monitoring monitoring them um even spending like so much like so many so much time in the hot beating sun on the rooftop grinding meat for these for these birds and stuff and just the dedication um is is incredible to watch and i i love a film like that especially when i really don't know a lot about the subject matter i love getting into into something like that and learning something new in in that regard um though there is (laughs) there was a part there is a little bit a connection because just offhandedly they're talking about um a wwe hell in the cell match this like the famous match uh between the undertaker and mankind and kind of regarding it in an art way and i just like really appreciate that part as a guy that's straddling the line between wrestling fandom and movie fandom <laughs> i thought that was really great um but i i mean this be- this movie is really beautiful to look at too and it comes down to uh, something that uh, sen talked about in an interview and he said uh the idea was to shoot it not like a reg- regular nature doc or a wildlife doc but to make it cinematic uh, we took our time. We wanted to shoot it like a proper high art film and not like a wildlife dog. So we committed ourselves to the visual grammar of that. And I really think that that comes through. I think it makes it um, any dryness in the subject matter doesn't come through because it's presented on such a bigger scale. It feels like um, I know it's kind of like weird to describe, but once you've actually like seen how Sen puts it together. Um, yeah, I think I think my my thoughts won't sound so crazy, um, but it's a, a well done film. It's a 99 uh, certified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes, and I really think it does speak to that high of a grade. Uh, and yeah, easy to access if you have a uh, crave. So uh, definitely check it out. Moving on to the much anticipated new season of Mayor of Kingstown. The McLusky family are power brokers tackling themes of systemic racism, corruption, and inequality in Kingstown, Michigan, where the business of incarceration is the only thriving industry. Starring Jeremy Renner, created by Hugh Dillon and Taylor Sheridan, available on Paramount+. 
I'm going to come out right now and say it. This is the best thing that Taylor Sheridan has created, in my opinion. Uh, he's the guy that did Yellowstone. He also did the Tulsa King with uh, Sylvester Stallone. Like, he's building this little TV empire. But this is the second series that he did outside of Yellowstone. And I think he found something really good here. Uh, Jeremy Renner is so great. And I'm really grateful that we got this season because he had like a near fatal snowplow accident like a mm. couple of years ago. And he looks great in the show. Like you could, you would never know that he was almost dead in a hospital at one point and like having to go through like so much rehabilitation. Um, Cause he rocks still. This show is so gritty, so well told. I really, really love the, the, the character stuff in this. I don't want to get too deep into season three because there is a spoiler stuff um, between season two, season three developments. Um, but um, again, it, it's kind of like a, a crime series. I, I, I don't know how appealing this is to you, but um, I, I know a lot of people are waiting for this show to come back. Uh, me and the wife included. Um, so I'm super happy to have it back and uh, I'll definitely tackle it again once uh, I'm done it. And now that it's over. Uh, so let's move on to yet another streaming service. But there's two that came out for this particular service. It's the Outlaws. Seven strangers from different walks of life are forced together to compete to complete a community payback sentence in Bristol. Starring Christopher Walken, Stephen Merchant, Rianne Barreto, Darren Boyd, Gamba Cole, Jessica Gunning, Claire Perkins, Eleanor Tomlinson, and Charles Babalola. Created by Elgin James and Stephen Merchant. Available on Prime Video. I actually checked this one out, like, I think, like, a, a while ago. Like, maybe, like, a year ago. Um, I watched, like, quite a few episodes, but I... I couldn't get into it. Really? I see. I like how you remember that show skins. Mm -hmm. I like how splintered the storyline is and how there's so many different things going on and that they're rounding each character out in their own way. I love the socialite character so much. I, I think she's so great. And just how, how shit her life is becoming. Like as soon as like she gets dumped by her girlfriend and everything and how like, just everything starts spiraling out of control. Christopher Walken is so good, especially when he's being like cheeky and mischievous. He's so good in, in, in that regard. Um, and, and a lot of the newcomers in this one that I haven't seen before, I really like, and I love Darren Boyd. Who's like the law, the, the sleazy lawyer. He's in a lot of British television for a long time. And I always appreciate his, uh, his presence in shows. Um, but for me, it's, well, of course, Stephen Merchant, too. I, I I would be remiss if I didn't bring him up. He's always mm -hmm. great. And the fact that he uh, he writes this show, that he created this show. I mean, Stephen Merchant, we wouldn't have The Office without Stephen Merchant. Um, he is a big heavyweight when it comes to comedy and television. And he's got he's got a true gift for it that keeps on giving. Um, Elgin James, the other co-creator of this one, he created Mayans MC which is the spinoff of Sons of Anarchy and a show that I've found it very hard to get into. Because um, I feel like I've been there, done that with Sons of Anarchy. Like, it's just like, okay, I don't don't really need this. I, I am going to try to make a deeper dive, um, but I'm really just starting out in Outlaws. Uh, the reason I'm bringing it up this week is season three is just hitting Prime Video right now. Um, and I, I'm guessing you may, cause it's short seasons, I believe. So I'm guessing you made it probably through season one. I think into so. Season two. Yeah. Yeah. I'm willing to give it a shot. Um, it's not jumping to the top of my list right now, but it's uh, definitely on there cause uh, I, I liked what I've seen so far. All right. And I know you've been chomping at the bit to talk about this one. The boys season four. A group of vigilantes set out to take down corrupt superheroes who abuse their superpowers. Oh boy. Starring Carl Urban, Jack Quaid, Anthony Starr, Aaron Moriarty, Jesse T. Usher, Laz Alonzo, Chase Crawford, Tomer Capone, Karen Fukuhara, Nathan Mitchell, Colby Minifee, Claudia Dumit, 
Susan Hayward and Jeffrey Dean Morgan, created by Eric Kripke, based on the Dynamite Entertainment comic book series by Garth Ennis and Derek Robertson, available on Prime Video. So you saw my, like, my the trouble of like, who do I, cause at first it was just going to say uh, starring Carl Urban, Anthony Starr and Jack Quaid. But I, I <laughs> like, I, I can't, it's so I can't, well-rounded. I can't. Like, yeah. I, like everybody gets so much screen time. I, 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 and everybody's I, so amazing. I know. I, I, even, I want to rep, I want to reference Colby Minifee. You know what I mean? Like even like the smallest performances on the show are not small performances. I, I really, really dig the show. I'm pissed. I'm pissed with the, the anti backlash. It's like people completely. The reactions. No- yeah. I'm really annoyed by that. You didn't see Frenchie's turn. You didn't see Frenchie's bisexuality. Then that's on you. That's hundred percent on you, and and I just I hate that they, we can't put platonic relationships on anything anymore. That it was always expected that Kamiko and 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 Frenchie's relationship was going to become romantic or sexual. That sucks. Yeah, that sucks, I mean, and it's so like, limiting. Yeah, like I I thought it was going to, and I was literally like, oh, it's not. But I wasn't like, oh, I'm gonna go t- talk shit on Twitter now. Yeah, like, it's just like, okay, that's not the direction that they're going with the character. That's yeah, fine. Like it doesn't ruin my life for them to not be together. Yeah, it's it's just it bo- it bothers me the this the anti woke mob coming for everything with their pitchforks and when they come for the boys it is so satirically hilarious because literally like this is literally what the boys is satirizing it's exactly it to to literally if if you don't like if you haven't caught on already that it's making fun of the right you're stupid absolutely but we have people that are they're glorifying homelander and idolizing homelander right so it's like it's hard it's it's just a it's just a hard thought that oh i was i didn't enjoy any of this show like holy crap i I had a whole rant about this this whole uh this whole woke thing i i don't even want to get into it now because it's just it's it's so annoying and, and to give it to give it any kind of breath is is reductive i feel like at a certain point um yeah. but it was announced this is the penultimate season uh season five will be the end which i kind of felt like it was coming I, how much more can you do yeah and i i don't know if that means that we're going to get a second season of gen v i think that that was possibly the plan yeah. um there is going to be no recasting on a major character due to his uh sad his tragic recent passing um which i was kind of blown away by that so chance palermo uh, Pader, uh perdomo that sucks yeah yeah and that was kind of his like star riser right there was that was was gen v so yeah. bummer because he, he he was he was good in that show I, I actually i really enjoyed gen v and i got i i watched it a bit late um so the internet so had already I. come for their hooks the internet had already had already thrown thrown it shade and uh i liked it so whatever yeah i really like um diabolical too the animated one oh animated diabolical one. was fun and many yeah. different animators and stuff in it that that was, yeah, there was a lot of great that. stories and a lot of cool callbacks to the original source material comic book which i really loved as well so mm-hmm. um i think it's easy to say that we're boys fan people here 100 percent. and uh the addition of jeffrey dean morgan is so much better i don't want to get into um spoiler territory any of this kind of stuff i think we'll save that for the uh f- the the final segment uh when we come to it on, on this uh eventually down the line but um yeah i'm I, i'm just excited to to dig into a lot more so oh i got to add some stuff to the shelves this week <laughs> yes new to the library i'm terrible at transitions um i got the new luke basson film it's a very personal film to luke basson as well because apparently he's gotten really interested in like the dog training 
um, fields and everything. Uh, it's a film called Dogman. Uh, so Luc Besson directed this. It's a quasi action film with Caleb Landry Jones. And every time I see that his kid's name pop up in a movie, I'm so interested in it immediately. Um, just a laundry list of great films that he's done. Nitram, he was really good in. Uh, he's the brother in Get Out. Okay. He's, yeah. He, he, anytime he's in a movie, watch it because it'll be really, really good. <laughs> he's such a great actor. Uh, there's no special features on this one, uh, but I just got it. So I'm looking forward to checking it out and I will bring the full review once that one's done. I got all six seasons of Dexter's Laboratory in one set. All right. You know, Dexter's Laboratory uh, is a series that ran from 1996 to 2003. There's 79 episodes. I, I mean, this is a launching point for uh, Craig McCracken, who, of course, did uh, Powerpuff Girls, uh, Butch Hartman, uh, who did Fairly Odd Parents, and Seth MacFarlane was an early animator on this show as well and had his start on this. So it's really cool. It just adds to this collection <laughs> that I have of great cartoons. Uh, this, I have the Foster's, uh, Foster's, uh, care. It's the same guy that did, um, um, Powerpuff Girls. I have that series. I have Ed, Ed, and Eddie Foster's Home for imaginary friends. That's the one. Yeah. I have that series. Love um, that I one. have, I have Ed, Ed, and Eddie. Uh, I have Rugrats, the original series, plus the two seasons of the new series. Um, and I have all grown up um i have uh the powerpuff girls i got that one fairly recently uh even far back i have flintstones on blu-ray like <laughs> yeah uh thanks to i mean warner brothers has so much crazy stuff in their vault and just to see so much more of it come out all the time uh like especially this next one <laughs> i got the complete series of welcome back cotter I you probably have no idea what this show is. Um, I know of the name because of Family Guy. Ah, uh, yes, yes. <laughs> I you know what you kind of have to thank Seth MacFarlane for keeping shows from the eighties and seventies relevant that people know who Bing Crosby is that people know, you know what I mean? That, and, and that people know who, who uh, Gabriel Kaplan and welcome back Cotter is this, this series. I mean, I really, really like this show in reruns. Um, this was John Travolta's breakthrough role. This is what got him carry. This is what got him Saturday night fever. Like this was the launching point. Um, and this is four seasons, uh, 95 episodes. The show aired from 1975 to 1979. Uh, and a fun fact, uh, when Quentin Tarantino met John Travolta, who he wanted to star in Pulp Fiction, uh, before pop production began, he took out his Welcome Back Cotter board game for them to play as an icebreaker. <laughs> that's, that's ballsy. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean... Tarantino with Pulp Fiction was like responsible for the resurgence of John Travolta. So it all kind of worked out. Yeah. All right. We're about to get out of here. We're about to get out of here. I got some reminders first. Yes. This week's reminders. Uh, Wild Goat Surf is now on VOD. Uh, I think it'll be on Crave very soon as well. Uh, I did a and a for this one. It's a local Penticton fil uh, filmed uh, movie um, by Caitlin Sponheimer. Um, I really, really enjoyed it. I'm a little bit biased, though. Uh, but my review is on the May 3rd episode of the show. Uh, I'm butting in for you right now. <laughs> Because I need okay. to know. I need to know what you thought about Doom. Doom? Yeah. Not <laughs> Doom Annihilation, because I saw you made the mistake of the did. first time, and we're watching Doom Annihil Annihilation. And Doom 2005 is better than Doom Annihilation. Can we agree on this before you start your review? I wouldn't know, because I tried putting on Doom Annihilation and then realized it was entirely in French. 
with mm. no option for French. I mean, for English. Probably better. So I was like, well, I can't watch that. Um, yeah, so then I put on Dune 2005. Why did they even call it Dune? Why did they even link it to the game? For that one scene. For the one scene. That one scene where, kicks where, ass. Where it looks like it's a video game. That scene kicks ass. That scene was like the only cool part of the movie. The rest of it, I literally just wanted to not watch that anymore. Richard Brake. Yeah. Gets killed in a bathroom stall. Yeah. Like, it, it, it was kind of just like, oh, there's Richard Brake. Okay. Carl Urban's on the screen. I'm going to pay attention. Oh, the rock's on the screen. I'm not going to pay attention anymore. And like, <laughs> <laughs> it's the rock in the early days. Yeah. I laughed when I saw the Semper Fi tattoo. That shit was so funny to me. <laughs> like across his back, just Semper Fi. Because he he has to be in the military. It's yep. I, I guess it's like in his contract or something. In every single movie he has to be <laughs> at in the that military. time, yeah. Still at currently. That time. <laughs> Unless he's a demigod in Moana, he has to be part of the military. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Okay. All right. So not a fan is at the end of the day, not a fan. It's not something I would watch again. I okay. I, I watched right. it for the the pop culture. There we go. I and be because I brought it up. Yeah. I brought it up. And you're like it was like something you like quietly wrote down. People can't <laughs> see your arms. Yeah. So you just like quietly wrote it down. <laughs> I just watched it because right, the other urban. That's it. There, okay. Yeah. It was the Carl Urban reference last week. Yeah. All right. Boy Kills World. Your thoughts? I really liked it. Um, but I watched it directly after Hardcore Henry. And so the action was a little bit underwhelming for me just because I think I was kind of spoiled a little bit beforehand. Mm -hmm. um, but I did really enjoy it. Uh, H. John Benjamin is funny, like always. Um, and of course, Bill Skarsgård. I mean, you, you have the to macaron die. scene fucking killed me. Yeah. It just killed me. I was laughing so hard in that scene. How he's like, not to get distracted, not to get distracted. <laughs> and he's just like, so distracted, just going to lose his mind for a bit. I caught some shit on um, after the credits for liking this film or recommend it because I saw it before uh, a lot of my co hosts saw it. And when they saw it, they're like, oh, you hyped this movie up and it was just is so trashy. And I'm like, yeah, it's dumb. It, it's, yeah, it's, it's, dumb. it's dumb. Like, it's it's so dumb. Uh, but I don't know. There's just something so horrendously like I'm a guy that comes from like the crow and stuff like that. Like, I, I, I still have a soft spot for shit like that. Yeah. And there's there's stuff that just works. Like the fact that Charlotte Copley is going to have this whole redemptive arc moment. And then they just drop that fucking thing on his head. Yeah. Is <laughs> stupid shit like that really gets me. So yeah, I, I like this movie. I, I'm looking forward to when it comes out on Blu-ray to to pick it up because it, it's it's stupid fun. And Andrew Koji, the guy that joins him for his adventure, mm -hmm. is so maniacally great in yeah. that movie. Like he has just lost his mind and it's fun. Cause I, I know him for another show. Um he was in oh he was in that really bad G.I. Joe spinoff, Snake Eyes. Oh. Um, but he's in an HBO show called Warrior that I, I quite like. All right, so that brings us to what's gonna go on next week. A little taste, I guess. And I you know what I, I'm I, I'm evaluating. I, I will be giving my thoughts on Inside Out too. Uh, but because that was one of our big movies this week, I, I can't lead with that. I have to have something different. Um, so on my list to watch upcoming is uh, the new film Velma with June Squibb, which looks like a revenge thriller comedy with an old lady, <laughs> June Squibb, who I am so down for this movie. Um, it looks like all kinds of fun. So I think that will probably be... The big number one, unless I come up with something different. It's a free for all. Who knows? Who knows? It, it could it could go anywhere. See, even you're scared by that. Yeah, you, you don't terrified. even know. You don't even know. No. But uh, 
<laughs> you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, Threads, and Letterboxd at the Steedle Dead. You can find me on Letterboxd at Honey Bun Chloe. I'm actually updating it now. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. After like it's six exciting months. News. This is exciting news. I'm really excited. And this is this is like the one like it was like the one thing that I was like, I know I'm not going to make you do social media, but can you can you try the letterbox? It's the one thing where there's like other users that can comment on your shit that I, I would love for you to be part of. And you were gung ho about it. So I'm super, super proud of that. I'm proud of you. <laughs> anyway you can find all of these episodes at uh the, oh, sorry on stevestebbing.ca if you're on the youtube page right now steve stabbing please just give us a like and a subscribe and maybe tell your friends about it share it around share the love i'm also on shiftheads.ca and on the facebook group where they have about four thousand members i believe still and uh well that's it that's all of our list we got to go fill it up again so until next time bye bye